We're in Mark chapter 9. I want to continue a thought. You know, a couple weeks ago, I, I, I preached on how everyone shall be salted with, with fire. And um, <clears throat> so that last, that last verse there, Jesus said, salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, Jesus said in this very famous church meeting called the Sermon on the Mount, He said, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. People use these verses to try to teach that you can lose your salvation. Uh, I want to tell you that you never had enough savor to be salty enough for God, no matter what you do. And you can trust Christ uh, maybe with some mental ascension. Uh, or mental assent and say, you know, um, Lord, I, yeah, I believe in you. Come in my heart and save me and still not have the grace of God in your life because you just made a choice. It takes God to save somebody. And when God saves somebody, he did it and it cannot be undone. So this cannot be teaching that you lose your salvation. As a matter of fact, the doctrine here is what I want to address first is that every professor of Christianity... Now, now, don't forget, a lot of times when Christ is talking to His church, and he, and especially when He does parables of the kingdom, He's talking about a church body. And within that church body, there is saved people and possibly even lost people, like Judas was standing here at this time when He was talking. Amen? So we have to understand that. And the doctrine here is that every professor of Christianity should take care that he actually has salt or saving grace in his heart. Every Christian should take care that he actually has saving grace in his heart. Amen. That's what we're talking about. So I want to consider three points this morning. And the title of my message is, Have Salt in Yourselves. Amen? My first point I want to consider is this. Why is saving grace compared to salt? That's an interesting thing that Jesus would use salt. And um, when I put these messages on YouTube lately, they go under the metaphors and parables of our Lord. And this is metaphorically speaking, the salt is metaphorically Grace, saving grace in your heart. So, why is grace compared to salt? Why would the Lord use salt here? Amen. Well, I got a few thoughts, and uh, I believe they're all doctrinal, so I, I pray it'll be a blessing to you. Number one, the reason I believe the Lord used salt as an illustration or a metaphor here is because salt causes great pain when applied to an open wound. Salt causes great pain when applied to an open wound. In John 16, verses 7 and 8, the Bible teaches that the Comforter, uh, the Spirit of God, will reprove the world of sin. Amen. Reprove the world of sin. I want you to know that reproof from God stings worse than physical fire, does it not? Amen. Um, we live in a day where everybody says, you know, I'm the salt of the earth and I'm saved. Not if you've not gone through repentance. Right. Amen. Repentance is when God is reaching down and you have an open wound of sin and he's applying the salt of grace to it and you don't like it. Yeah. Amen. Because he's telling you what you are. Amen. In Acts 16.30, uh, after the, the Philippian jailer had beaten them and so on, and then they sang praises at midnight, and then the jail was burst open with an earthquake. He came out. The Bible says that he was trembling, and he brought them out. He got them out of that jail. He didn't know what to do. 
He was just tore up and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The salt of God's grace had hit his open wound and um, he wanted relief from it. So I believe that's one reason saving grace is compared to salt. I believe another reason is that salt has a diffusing nature. When you put salt to something, it diffuses to every part. It doesn't just stay in that one locale. In 1 Corinthians 2.10, the Bible says that the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. I believe that when you get saved, it burns you at first. You don't like what God's trying to do. And then it goes to every part of you. Amen. When the grace of God comes into your life, it will enlighten your understanding. It will bend your will. It will pierce your affections. It will discover every sin and you'll know how ungodly you are before God Almighty. I believe that's why he says you need salt. I believe another reason saving grace here is compared to salt is because salt not only uh, uh, is painful when applied to an open wound and, and has a diffusing nature, but it also has a purging nature. Salt cleanses from corruption. Amen. That's why people without refrigeration could keep meats forever. It's because they pack them in salt. Amen. And I want you to know that uh, salt cleanses from corruption. So does the grace of God. As a matter of fact, uh, I was going to turn to this in my mind this morning. I, I've been struggling. I don't know why, but uh, I'm, I'm going to read this. But in Titus chapter 2, and, and listen to this, um, in, in uh, verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now watch what it does. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Amen. Amen. That's what the grace of God does. Somebody that says, don't hand me that law stuff. Uh, you're out here preaching the law because you're, you're naming sin. I believe in grace. They don't know what grace is. They don't have the salt in themselves that purges them and changes their lives. When a person is saved, every part of them gets saved. Amen? That means their car, their wallet, their life, all of them get saved. Amen? They change. Everything changes. Matter of fact, I found that when I was saved through the purging of salt or the purging of grace, I was given the grace of faith. Faith. I didn't have faith before. Acts 15, 9 says, And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. That's how my heart was purified, as God applied the salt of grace to my repentant heart and gave me faith. And faith in Christ is what keeps me from stumbling, keeps me from falling. It is His faith that He gave to me through His grace, and He'll never take it back. I've been given the grace of hope. In 1 John 3, 3, it says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. You know, when God saved me, He didn't only give me faith that, that keeps me standing in Him, but He also gave me hope because I know the Bible says He's coming back to get us. Amen? The Bible also teaches to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If I die in an accident going down the road, I want to wake up in the glory of God with the grace of salt in my life and have a pure life. Amen? Amen? He gave me that with the salt. You know, the, those that don't have this salt of grace, they just live like there is no God coming back, like Christ is not going to return. Yep. That's how they live. I've also been given the grace of love. In Psalm 97 and verse 10, he says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Yes. He preserveth the souls of His saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Amen. We can love our enemies, like Jesus said. We can love one another. We can love them that despitefully use us. We can love them that persecute us. Why? Because we've been sprinkled with the salt of grace, the um, saving grace of Jesus Christ in our hearts. Amen. 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 
So salt has, uh, causes great pain when it's applied to an open wound. It also has uh, a diffusing nature. Salt has a purging nature. But salt also has a preserving nature. I want to tell you something. It's the grace of God that keeps me from filthiness and sin. I don't want the things I once wanted before. Yeah. Amen. I've been preserved. God keeps me from falling. And it's just like Joseph, you know, why is it he was able just to run from Potiphar's wife? Why didn't he go like most men would have gone? Because he had the saving grace of God in his heart and he ran away from sin. And I used to not run away from sin at all. I'd always run toward it. Amen. It's like that devotion this morning. I always would just run toward it. I wasn't happy until I've sinned. I want you to know that we live in perilous times today with extreme corruption. We, needed, we need to be salted daily. Amen. We need to have salt within ourselves. And you say, what, what does that mean, Brother Sam? He's saying the saving grace that came into your life and, and it hurt when you first got saved, but man, it diffused through your body. It changed your life. It purged out your sins. It holds you up. He says, maintain a conscience that is clean before God. That's what He wants us to do. And you can only do that by the grace of God. You cannot maintain a good conscience without the grace of God. As a matter of fact, the same chapter talks about the conscience where he says, their worm dieth not in a place called hell. Amen? Have salt within yourselves. That's not go and get grace. That's make sure you have grace. Right. You didn't go buy the salt. Jesus said that He would salt every sacrifice. Amen? Right. So you better make sure you have His salt, and that's the salt of grace. Amen? So we see why saving grace is compared to salt. Now, my next question of the three points I want to consider is why should every professor, every person that professes to be saved have salt in themselves? Why? Why does he tell us that? I'm going to tell you why. Because the best of us, and I mean in this room, those of us that are truly saved, even the best of us, when it comes to our flesh, we are altogether corrupt. It does not mean does not matter how long you've been saved. I mean, next month it will be uh, 29 years that I've been saved, and my flesh is just as corrupt as it ever was. We got temptations on every side. This flesh loves the world. It is a willing participant with the temptations of Satan. We are in constant danger of heresy. Everywhere we turn, there is false doctrine being taught. Some of it sounds good to those who don't really know the Word of God. We all have a tendency to decay in our holiness. Is that not true? Every one of us, even though Christ has saved us and changed us and given us all this faith and hope and love and all these wonderful things, at the same time in our flesh, we have a terrible tendency to decay, amen, to be worse and worse. Right. I want to tell you something else. Doubts and fears will consume our hearts. We'll, we'll be going along with the Word of God, and the next thing you know, we're not uh, obeying the Word of God because some doubt or fear, some decision we've made has consumed our hearts. We have to have grace in our hearts to stay by the course, to stick by the stuff, to apply grace, to stand with our Lord. Amen. And I want to tell you something. Every professor should have salt within himself because you can only serve God in His grace. If you've never been shown the grace of God, you cannot serve God. I don't care if you're the richest person in the church and you give everything and you do everything that the preacher asks, you cannot save yourself. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace. Amen. Did you hear what he said? Right. Let us have grace. In other words, that saving grace in our hearts at all times that Jesus gave us at salvation. And he says this, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. 
Now we can bear affliction because of the grace of God. Obadiah Holmes, we know the old story. Um, matter of fact, it, it's September 5th, I believe. Um, 16, I think it was 1639, or no, 1641, that he was beaten in Boston Square till the blood filled his boots. And then afterwards he said, I could well bear it because of the grace of God. He said, in a way, it's like you've beaten me with roses. Amen. And he did. He bore it because of the grace of God. We can bear things because of the grace of God. God. That's why Christ said, have grace in yourselves. Make sure you are saved by God's grace. And then the, then the floodgates of grace are open to you to use daily in your life. We're also to season others. Did you know that? Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man, Colossians 4, 6. We are to season others. We can't do that unless we first have salt or grace in ourselves. Amen? Amen. So, why saving grace is compared to salt? I believe God shows us spiritually um, how salt can burn and cause great pain when it's applied to the open wound uh, the same way grace does with sin. Uh, if grace comes and there's no burning of your sin, it's not grace. You have an emotional uh, appetite for the things of God instead of God actually changing your life. Amen? It, it has a diffusing nature. In other words, when you get saved, it goes throughout the whole your whole life. It has a purging nature in that when you get saved, it changes your life inside out. It has a preserving nature that it keeps a man from the filthiness of sin. It totally changes the way you act. Amen. Amen. So then we found, well, the next question was, why every professor should have salt within himself? Because we are corrupt in our flesh. And we've got to have that salt daily or we're in trouble. Amen. We will sin and get in trouble with God. But my next point is this. Who are those that are well-salted, savory Christians? How do you know them? How, do, how can we tell? Amen? First of all, it's those who have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's where it starts. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It can only come through the blood of Jesus Christ. If we think we're saved because we like church or we like hymns or gospel music, or we like to be around Christians, or we like the idea of Christianity, or maybe we said a prayer when we were age five and, and so on, and we believed in Jesus ever since. If that's us, I want you to know that you've not been washed in the blood. Amen. When you get washed in the blood, it's because you realize you are defiled and you need a washing. Amen? And it's not just, again, a mental ascension. It's not going, yeah, I'm a sinner, you know, like anybody else. We're all sinners, you know. Yeah, let me, well, let me say the prayer and trust Jesus and I'll be okay. That's straight out of the Romans road, which is the road to hell. I'm sorry, but it is. No, you must be washed in the blood. You must be made a new creature by the power of God's spirit. That's right. And that's the salt of grace and what it does in your life. Amen. So you have to be washed in the blood. The second thing is, is when we say, well, who are those that are well-salted, savory Christians? Number one, they've been washed in the blood. Number two, they are identified by their new behaviors. Not necessarily by their testimony of their mouth, but by their new behaviors. That's right. We are to walk in the Spirit, not just ascend to the Spirit. That's right. Not think about the Spirit. We are to walk in the Spirit. There's new changes that takes place when a person gets saved. For instance, immediately my tongue changed. Immediately. Now, that old tongue is still uh, a, a terrible, evil member. Amen. As long as we're in the flesh, that tongue has the opportunity to do what it will. But when I got saved, the grace of God got a hold of my tongue. I don't like cursing anymore. Right. 
I used to be the worst one. I was well known even when I was 10 and 11 years old for having the filthiest mouth in school. I was known for that. I can't believe that now. I don't want anything to do with that. I, I don't want to curse. I, I don't want to say something filthy. I don't want to drag Jesus' name through the mud. And I don't want to hear it either. I want to tell you what else changed, the way I dressed. People say, ah, oh, you're judging. No, my apparel changed. Amen? Uh, that's why you don't see me wearing the same things. I'm not standing out half naked waxing my car on a sunny day because God's grace has salted my heart and I no longer can do those things. I just can't and I don't want to. Amen? My attitude changed. That's right. Totally changed. You know, I used to think that God was against me. Parents were against me. Wife was against me. Army was against me. My job, whatever, all against me. But I'm going to tell you what, when the grace of God entered my life, I found that I was the problem. Yep. It was me. It. I'm the problem. Yep. And you know what I have found? That most of the time in my life now, almost 29 years of being saved and still having a flesh that is just as corrupt as it ever was, I, I want you to know that I, I still need God to change my attitude. And I realize that when I fail, it's usually because of my attitude. Oh, if Christians would get in touch with that. We have so many people that leave churches angry. Angry. Well, if, you know, if we're all trying to serve God, the best of us, okay, we're still corrupt in our flesh. That's why there's things in the Bible about love and, and things about preferring one another and things about praying for one another if, if they've not committed a sin unto death. And then there's discipline and how to do it. And the purpose of discipline is to restore one another. That's the purpose. Amen. Uh, we've, we've got all that there and still people get hurt. They get angry and they leave churches because, well, they didn't love me over there. And then some moron over in another church will say, well, don't worry, we'll love you here. And they've never been sprinkled with grace. They think just because they're a Baptist, they're saved. Yep. God, help us that people do not understand salvation. Can I tell you, people can grow up in a preacher's home and hear the gospel week in, week out, two, three times a week, and still be 40 years old and not know how to be born again. I know of one case where a preacher's son fell into sin. He was doing fine. He went back into his old sin. And then his words when he was confronted and trying to be helped was, well, I thought when you said we got saved, the Spirit would come in and just take all that away from me. <laughs> so here he was wanting grace to not work with his flesh. He wanted grace to just make him a robot, a mindless robot. Yeah. And he failed. It was his attitude. People don't have the right attitude. I want you to know that I, I got a new zeal when I was saved. When I was sprinkled with salt, every sacrifice will be salted. You'll either be salted with fire in hell or salted with the fire of the Holy Ghost. It's one of the two, amen? But when Jesus salted me and changed my life, I had a new zeal. Now I become zealous of good works. Amen. Where I used to want to uh, uh, go out and, and get drunk and, and raise cane and all these things. And I'd, I'd want to be all involved in my life, just dumped into sports and anything I could put on my flesh to feel good. Now I don't like it. Now I want to have a zeal to tell others about Christ and the victory that I've gained in these 29 years because of the salt of the grace of God. I'm going to tell you something else. You can tell a well-salted, savory Christian because of temperance. Because of temperance. You know, um, it disturbs me that we see preachers that are 350 pounds and they, um, and, and I, listen, we can all gain weight. I have, I'm, I'm still working on things. I, I'm heavier than I like to be right now. There's no doubt about that. And there's things in life that can do that to you. Different toxins and so on. I get it all. But for a guy that has to just eat and eat and eat and eat, and then once we're done eating an hour later, when are we going to eat again? Yeah. That guy is not temperate, and he's not having salt within himself. Right. Amen? I'm so sick of that. They want to, we, we talked about that the other day. 
I'm so sick of hearing people say, well, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, but yet you can eat like a two-headed hog three to five times a day. Yep. Amen? Isn't that right? Yep. That is not temperance. And the Lord has taught me temperance. I don't want to be drunk. I don't want to walk around and, and just go beyond uh, satiation with food. I don't want those things. Amen. Why? Because the grace of God changed my life and I don't want them. Amen. And that's a power that only God has. And He salted me with that grace. And another way you can know a well-salted, savory Christian is because He endures. You know, these people that get on the internet and man, they just really... I found a real church or this and that and they rail on everybody else and a year or two later you can't find them. A year or two later you find out things like dude leaves his wife or some woman overseas. Yep. Uh, that's a problem. Let me tell you what the problem was. He's never been salted with grace. Amen. Never. And he better repent because if he don't, he's going to be salted with the fire of hell. That's right, brother. He is lost. Amen. When yep. you get saved, you endure. You don't just, you're, you're not a fly by night. Right. Amen. You don't just fly up and then burn out. You're not a match. Right. You know, God lights us with an eternal flame and he gives us endurance. Yes, we will fall. Yes, we will get into the flesh. Yes, we'll have to confess. Yes, we'll have to get right with God. And yes, God will chasten us at times. The Bible says if you've never had that, you're a bastard. God knows our struggle with the flesh. But overall, through the process of sanctification, there is endurance. You'll find that the person that started out ends better. Yep. That's the way it is. Amen. But all these people quitting because of this and because of that. And I don't like this and I don't like that and all that. That's not a well-salted, savory Christian. So, what do we know about this? Here, here's the doctrine of what we're teaching. And this will make sense of every parable, every metaphor, that Jesus is usually talking about His kingdom. And that every professor of Christianity, and that means uh, those that are in church and those that are not, or whatever, they should take care that they actually have salt from Christ or saving grace in their hearts. Yeah. They should take care. The Bible says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's talking to those disciples. Judas is right there in the midst of them. He, and he tells them basically, take care that you have the saving grace of God and you have that salt or you're going to face the salt of fire in a place called hell. So how do we apply this? Well, if you're a sinner and you've never been born again, let me say you need to get salt. All the unsavoriness in this world is because men are not salted by the grace of God. Don't you know we would not have abortion if men were salted by the grace of God? We would not have uh, homosexuality, sodomy as God calls it, if men were salted with the grace of God. But they're not salted by the grace of God. And I want to tell you something. There is, uh, there, there is sin... Uh, at the door, there is sin in your life when you're not saved. I don't care if you're a nice person. I don't care if you're a wicked person or a mean person. When you're lost, you are full of sin from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Even if you're a Pentecostal and you got one of them big bouffant hairdos on top, I want you to know from the top of the hairdo all the way to the bottom of your feet, you're lost. You're full of sin. There's nothing you can do. There's no salt in you. And I want you to know this. There is no sin that cannot be changed by the salting of the grace of God. No sin. I love that song. There's room at the cross for you. You know, though millions have come, there's still room for one. Oh yes, there's room at the cross for you. 
If you have never been born again by the power of God, but you made some emotional profession and you struggle to keep up appearances and you've got a facade, I want you to know you're going to be sprinkled by the fires of hell. You better get salted by the grace of God and get born again. Amen. Get the salt and then you can apply it every day. For the saved people, you simply apply the salt. Simply apply the salt to the grace of God. It disturbs me that people will say they're saved and they'll have all this testimony, but in their life, you don't see them following up with things like baptism. Yeah. Now, when, when the Bible says it's an answer of a good conscience toward God, that bothers me when somebody refuses to get baptized yep. or to find a church. Now, I understand ignorance, but once someone tells you uh, and, and I know this, when I got saved, my life changed. I wanted to find the people of God. Amen. I didn't care what that was or how that looked. I wanted to find the people of God and I wanted to be with those people and serve God together. Amen. Amen. That's what I wanted to do. So people like that that can just take the promises of God and the commandments of God and just kind of uh, just, just throw them to the side I got news for you. You probably really don't have salt within yourself. Yeah. Amen. You probably don't have salt and you need to go to step one and get born again by the grace of God. Amen. But for those of us that are saved and yet we battle with the flesh every day, just apply that salt. You keep applying the grace of God. You keep looking to the Word of God and through prayer and through uh, preaching and through fellowship and through testimony. That's all salt being poured on against your flesh and it will preserve you and it will prevent corruption and you'll grow more and more like Christ every day. Now I think when we read Mark 9 and verse 50, it seems to make more sense, doesn't it? Amen. Make sure you have salt within yourselves. I pray that someone that would, that's listening to this message who's not saved will get born again. Amen. Amen. I pray that somebody would listen to this message that is saved and they'll quit playing around and get to the church of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, when you get saved, you'll get the right Bible. You'll get the right church. You'll get it all. Amen. And I just pray that somebody out there does. Oh, it's so good to be saved, isn't it? I remember how much that salt stung me. I hated listening to that preacher preach. He kept nailing me to the wall and come to find out that was the salt of the grace of God straightening me out. I was trying to blame him and it was God all that time because he loved me enough to show me his grace that in his holiness, he cannot tolerate my sin. Boy, oh boy, thank God for his grace. Amen. Have salt within yourselves. Let's pray.